in the video on the fourth coalition. I forgot to add one super important consequence of the treaties of Tilsit, and especially the Treaty of Tilsit with Prussia. I already talked about that it was all about carving up Prussia and really humiliating Prussia and really removing it from the status of one of, of, of one of the preeminent powers. And all I talked about was the loss of the western, uh, the, the territories of Prussia west of the Elbe, and that's about that area right there. But just as important as that, the, the Polish holdings of Prussia. So all of this area right up let me all of this area right over here. This also was removed from Prussia and became a French satellite state and became the Duchy of Warsaw. Duchy of Warsaw. So I just really want to emphasize the Treaty of Tilsit. I only emphasize kind of what happened on the western side of Prussia, but the eastern side of Prussia also got carved up, and Prussia essentially lost half of its half of its size. So it was very dramatic humiliation for Prussia at the end of the Treaty of Tilsit or the Treaties of Tilsit. Now with that out of the way, we talked about in the last video that at the end of the Fourth Coalition, Napoleon was kind of near the peak of his power. He'd kind of done everything right. He had this kind of steady upward momentum in his in in or France had a steady upward momentum in its in its power. But what we're going to see in this video is at least the beginnings of the downfall of of Napoleon. You're not going to it's not going to be obvious when you look at the territory because it's from a territorial point of view you're going to see in this video that he's actually gaining territory, but he's going to start doing some of the actions that uh, end up undermining him. So we talked about in the last video, we talked about this whole notion of the continental system. Continental continental system where Napoleon was obsessed with people on the continent of Europe boycotting England, not, a, not trading with England. And he figured this was the only way that he could really undermine England's dominance on the ocean or, or undermine, or eventually maybe even undermine England generally. So he was very, you know, as we said in the treaties of Tilsit, he got Russia to participate in the continental system. So he wanted everyone to buy into it. And one party that at this point, we're talking about, we're in 1807 now, we are in 1807 now. One party that wasn't all that keen in participating in the continental system was Portugal. That's Portugal right there. So Napoleon goes and chats. Well, you know, they didn't chat directly, but he gets the agreement of the King of Spain. This is Charles IV, and he's going to look like a bit of a fool in this video. So this is Charles. This is Charles the Fourth. Napoleon says, hey, Charles, let's go in there. Let's go into Portugal, that little upstart country that doesn't want to participate in the continental system. You and me, we'll invade together. We'll bring them into kind of our, our realm of influence. And you know, we can both kind of pillage the lands and, and get the wealth of Portugal. Charles IV, he's, he's all up for this. So, he, so a combined French and Spanish force invade Portugal. So in 1807, this is the end of 1807, it's actually October. Let me write this down in October. You have a combined French and Spanish invasion. Invasion of Portugal. And they are able to take Portugal, but we're going to see that it's reasonably temporary. Now, I just mentioned that this guy is going to look like the fool of this video. And the reason is, is because for with the excuse of reinforcements, obviously. Obviously, to get to Portugal, you have to go through Spain. So with the excuse of sending in reinforcements, Napoleon in 1808, this is in 1808, and now we're talking about early 1808, in particular in March. So with the excuse of sending in reinforcements to support the Portugal campaign, and Spain's like, oh, you're my ally. Yeah, sure. Send those hundred thousands of troops right through our territory. We're not going to worry about it. And with that, ex with that excuse, Napoleon was able to send 100,000 troops and occupy Madrid, and occupy Madrid. So this is one of those lessons of never get too greedy. This guy got greedy, wanted to help Napoleon, or even I guess the other lesson is be careful who your friends are. Uh, this guy wanted to in invade Portugal, but the the side effect of it is that. Uh, Madrid gets occupied, and that actually he gets dethroned, and. And so, you know, you have this the situation here. The the French are now in control of Spain. In May, in May of 1808, in May 
of and this and and this is really going to be the first little spark that is kind of the downfall of Napoleon in May May 2nd May 2nd 1808 a popular uprising starts in Madrid Cinco dos de Mayo so popular uprising in Madrid popular uprising and at the same time a little bit after that so you know you can imagine this is a, a hugely tumultuous time you have uh, you know you have this uh, i guess occupation of portugal with the excuse of reinforcements in march the french troops occupy madrid occupy madrid then in May, so you know, a couple of months later, a popular uprising starts in Madrid. This leads to popular uprisings throughout Spain. But at the very same time as this, this is a little bit after the uprising in May. Napoleon says, "Oh, you know, this is just a little uprising. I'm still in control of Sp of Spain." He he appoints his other brother. Remember, he, he does this whole business. He's putting his brothers in charge of of different parts of the empire. He puts his brother. He puts his brother Joseph. He puts his he appoints his brother Joseph, or you could kind of say he inserts his jo uh, brother Joseph as the king of Spain, as the king of Spain, king of Spain. So this is all in kind of you know early mid 1808. Spain is in all of this you know turmoil. Uh, the, a new king has been appointed, who's Napoleon's brother. The old king is no longer in charge. You have this. Uh, you you have an ongoing battle in Portugal. They don't have a firm hold on Portugal just yet. And in the rest of 1808, the 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 uprising that occurs throughout Spain is actually. Pretty successful in enforcing the French troops to to retreat. So French retreat. So then there's a French retreat. French retreat. And a, a major, I guess, aspect of this of this uprising is it's it's one of the first real national uprisings in history, where you know it's 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 it, people are saying we are Spanish, we do not like being controlled by uh, the French, we do not like how they have treated our royalty. We as a as a nation are going to rise up. And the other interesting aspect of this whole uprising that it starts it starts in Madrid with Dos de Mayo, but then it starts continuing throughout the whole nation. Is the idea of guerrilla warfare, guerrilla warfare, not gorilla warfare, guerrilla, guerrilla warfare, and this comes from the Spanish for little war, guerrilla, not from the uh, the the large ape, uh, and and what it what it implies, and you've probably heard the word on the news before, is kind of a non-conventional style of fighting, where uh, a small little groups kind of uh, engage their enemy in very non-traditional styles. So it becomes a, a very a painful, uh, at least for Napoleon's forces, it became very difficult fighting this, these non-conventional battles all over Spain. So they were able to force the French to, re to retreat. Napoleon says, gee, you know what? If you, if you want a job well done, you got to do it yourself. So Napoleon comes in at the end of the year and then he retakes Madrid. So December of 1808 in December Napoleon Napoleon back in Madrid. Back in Madrid. Now, you might say all is, you know, fine and well now Napoleon is back here. He has firm control of Spain, but not everything is good because as you could imagine, there's all these other characters here that keep forming coalitions uh, for and against Napoleon. I mean, even when they say that they're allied, you know, in, in the back of their minds, they can't wait until they can de declare the next uh, uh, <laughs> declare the next war on Napoleon. So in 1809, in 1809, let me write this down. 1809. In 1809, Austria declares war. Austria declares war. And since Great Britain was is in this <laughs> at this point in time perpetual war with France, this becomes the fifth coalition declares war. And this is the fifth coalition. But this one is fairly short-lived. Napoleon says, "Gee, I got, I got, you know, th these guys on my eastern front. You know, Austria is is 
is re-declaring war on me. So he leaves Spain to go lead that fight. And he leaves 300,000 of his best troops in Spain to hold Spain. And frankly, this is the most important side effect of the Fifth Coalition, is that it, allow, it makes Napoleon uh, go to fight Austria to lead that effort, as opposed to worrying about Spain. And essentially, by doing that, it, it allows and I don't know if it's necessarily the fact that Napoleon wasn't there, but the it, it could be because Napoleon wasn't there, is that Spain just becomes a major thorn in Napoleon's side. This guerrilla warfare just continues on and on and on, and it just goes back and forth. And the French will win a battle, and they'll win another battle, but they still don't have control, and these guerrillas will kind of peck at them and continue the uprising. And this really just drains the French army, and really just gets at them little bit by little bit, really over the, the, the remainder of Napoleon's reign, so all the way until 1814. We haven't gone over that yet, but this, this occurs all the way to 1814. So I said at the beginning of the video, this is one of the, the starting points of Napoleon's downfall. And that's just because he was just stuck in Spain. He was just stuck in Spain uh, from 1808 on, just continuing to have to send troops and supplies and reinforcements and, and wealth to support what they call the Peninsular Campaign. The Peninsular Campaign. And it just drains him. It drains his resources. It drains his energy. And it really hurts his ability to fight uh, wars with all of the other people who he, who he needs to fight wars with. This is one of the major downfalls. The other one, which we'll probably talk in either the next video or a video after that, is his invasion of Russia, which he does in 1812. And that that's super. Uh, that 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 you know, you, one could debate which one drains uh, of France's resources more. But the invasion of Russia really decimates uh, Napoleon's forces and really makes him susceptible to, uh, to to really conquest by England and all of the other uh, allies. And we're going to see that in a couple of videos. So you have this peninsular campaign continuing to drain Napoleon. He was, you know, it all started because he wanted to enforce the, the, the continental system on Portugal. And he got a little bit of greedy, and he also wanted to conquer Spain. And just to, just to highlight why it's called the Peninsular Campaign, this right here, a little bit of geography, this is called the Iberian Peninsula right there that I'm circling. So you could call it the Iberian Peninsular Campaign, because it's everything that's going on on this peninsula in Spain and Portugal. Iberian Peninsula. Peninsula. Pinin. Let me write that a little. Peninsula. Now, if we back up a little bit, back to 1808, where we had this uprising in Spain and they were able to push the French back, at the same time, you also had a popular uprising in Portugal in late, roughly in the fall, in the late summer or fall of 1808. The British got excited. They saw it as their chance to push Napoleon out of Portugal. So you have. This gentleman right here, Sir Arthur Wellesley, he's a future Duke of Wellington. And he's eventually going to be responsible for pushing Napoleon out of Spain entirely, or at least out of Madrid. So this is Sir Arthur, Sir Arthur Wellesley. He, him, and along with the British, and along with the Portu Portuguese are able to push the French out and August of 1808. So let me put this in our in my not so neatly drawn timeline here. So in December Napoleon is back. So right before that in August August out of Portugal, out of Portugal. And this is another motivation for Napoleon to say, "Gee, you know what? Things aren't going well on the Iberian Peninsula. I have to take charge of things myself." Now, at the very same time as all of this is happening and this is really just kind of out of interest, you could imagine that, uh, well, it's more than out of interest, because it actually has you know, huge global repercussions. You might say, OK, well, OK, you have the Siberian Peninsula. Spain is going back and forth between the French and the guerrillas. And you, you know, Portugal has this whole situation where uh, their king was dethroned, but then the, the British help and take it back. But you could imagine that these nations are in just a super state of flux in a super state of flux. Now you could also imagine, I mean, these the, the king of Spain wasn't just the king of Spain. He was king of the Spanish Empire. And the Spanish Empire this, I mean, the main the main landmass of the Spanish Empire was in the Americas. 
So this right here, that was the Spanish Empire at the time. And this was a 400-year-old Spanish Empire, all from you know, starting with, you know, Columbus sailing the ocean blue in 1492. You had this huge Spanish Empire, and and one of the really important side effects of Napoleon invading Spain and having this long, uh, protracted engagement in Spain is it, it, it catalyzed the ability of these colonies at the time to start looking for their independence. And we're going to do whole videos on that in the future. But this really is one of the things that allowed them to get independence. But, you know, Obviously, if the empire is in flux, these guys can say, hey, gee, we don't have, you know, why do we have to listen to that, to that, to that nation anymore that we don't even know who's in charge there? At the same time, same thing in Portugal. Brazilian independence didn't come until a little bit later after this period, but this is Napoleon's invasion is what really sparked the beginning of a lot of turmoil in Portugal, and that eventually is one of the causes that leads to the eventual independence of Brazil. That doesn't happen for another 10 or 15 years, but this is, you could imagine, this is where a lot of that action can be traced back. Now, another interesting point that occurred around around this time. And actually, I didn't tell you what happened on the Fifth Coalition. I said Austria declared war. Obviously, uh, Britain was already at war, so it was the Fifth Coalition. Napoleon had to leave. That maybe made Spain a little bit harder to hold for France, and that's why it kind of bled France slowly. But Napoleon was able to take care of Austria, and then he was able to take a little bit more land from them. Actually, Galicia, this area of Austria, was given to the Duchy of Warsaw, which was a French satellite state, and then Austria once again had to say, oh, gee, Napoleon, we're your friend. We're going to do whatever you ask us to. So you can imagine at this time, land-wise, the empire of Napoleon seemed pretty dramatic. You know, you could you could include Spain here, although he had to spend a lot of resources to keep Spain. And then now we had Austria, at least was in, in the fold. You know, Prussia was not really happy about it, but this whole area here, kind of this, the 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 western half of Poland was under French control. Germany. You know, the Confederacy of the Rhine, which is now Germany, and then a good bit of Italy, the Kingdom of Italy, Italy was also a, a a French satellite state. But Napoleon, of course, you know, he he wanted everyone to participate in the continental system. That's the only way to really strangle England. And the Papal States were not participating in the continental system. So the Papal States right there were not participating in the continental system. So they, you know, he sent some people over to, to kind of try to convince them to. And when when they didn't they occupied the Papal States. So French troops occupied the Papal States. And then once again, this we're going into this was still back in eighteen oh eight. This was actually early eighteen oh eight, it's just on a different front. So in February up here in eighteen oh eight, actually that's before they even occupied Madrid. So in eighteen oh eight February, French troops occupy Papal States. Occupy Papal States, they essentially give them over to the Kingdom of Italy, which at that time was a French uh, satellite state. So it's almost like annexing it to France. And then once the Fifth Coalition was done with, Napoleon felt so good about himself that he formally annexed the Papal States to, and then now we're in 1809. In 1809, he formally, he formally, so this is 1809. 1809, the Papal States are actually annexed into the French Empire. Papal States annexed. Now, you can imagine that the Pope wasn't that happy about this. This is the Pope at the time. This is Pius VII. Pius Pius VII. He wasn't so happy about it, so he excommunicates Napoleon. And I'll do a whole video on excommunication, but it's really about as bad as something you could do to someone within the powers of the Catholic Church. And by implication, you're no longer part of the Church, and you will probably go to hell now, at least if the Pope has anything to do with it. So, the you know Napoleon wasn't happy about this. He sent some people, some officers, to once again talk to the Pope about it. Say, hey, gee, why do you want to excommunicate Napoleon? Why don't you just play nice? Why don't you just you know uh, you know agree to whatever Napoleon says? The Pope doesn't agree, and so he gets abducted. This is why it's interesting. Napoleon, he's he's you know he's he's not afraid to take some serious action. So he gets abducted in 1809 by French officers. Abducted. Ab. Abducted in 1809 by French officers. 
And it's not clear, that it's not obvious that Napoleon told them to do it. But once he was abducted, and they actually started shuttling him around or all around France, depending on who uh, needed to talk to him or you know where you know if he was afraid that the British might try to free him from one port, they would send him someplace else. But it wasn't clear that Napoleon ordered this, but he never ordered his release. So in some ways, you got to say that it was sanctioned by Napoleon. So all of this mess starts. You know, Napoleon's messing with the Pope. He has this ongoing uh, a bleeding going on in Spain. And that ends, actually, in 1812, where Sir Arthur Wellesley finally retakes Madrid. But in, during this whole period, you can imagine it's really draining into the resources of the French, of the French Empire.